Hello, over the last couple of months, myself and the One Lone Community Discord server have created a new geometry library called OLC Util Geometry 2D. The purpose of this library is to perform all sorts of geometric analyses between two-dimensional shapes, such as how does a triangle overlap with a circle? What are the intersection points? Does the circle contain lines? How do rays bounce off of these shapes? For the latter part of last year, I've been working on various algorithms and game prototypes, and I found myself reusing bits of code all over the place, generally copying and pasting it where it was needed. This is symptomatic of the need for a library. As is often the case, however, the library grew arms and legs pretty quickly, and before I knew it, I needed the help of the community. So I jumped onto the One Lone Coder Discord server and asked for help, and naturally being a nice bunch, they all obliged. The result is a work in progress, but it's quite a comprehensive two-dimensional library, with many routines applicable to two-dimensional game programming. As is usually the case when I create something new, I like to do a small introduction video about how to use it. So here we go. For a change, before we start diving into the specifics and the complexities of this library, I thought I'd show us just using it. Here I have a bare bones C++ program, and I'm going to include the geometry library. If you're a long time user and abuser of one loan coder stuff, the first thing to note is that you will need to have C++ version 20 set as your language standard. And because modern C++ is a bit wordy these days, it makes sense to use the using namespace feature of the language to get rid of all of the prefix garbage this library needs. And whilst I'm mentioning one loan coder legacy stuff, Note, there is no inclusion of the OLC Pixel game engine. This Geometry 2D library can be used completely standalone. Let's start with the simplest geometric primitive, a point. In this library, this is an OLC VF2D. Okay, that bit is stolen from the Pixel game engine, but we still don't need to include it in order to have access to it. Here is a point defined at location 1010 in the X and Y axes. The purpose of this library is to perform analyses between different geometric primitives. I'm going to begin with something very simple, a circle. Now, the library is deliberately bare bones. It is intended that the user wrap up shapes and things accordingly to suit their needs. This circle type is provided by the library, and we're going to tell it to use floating point innards. In this case, it has a center position of 20, 20, and a radius of 15. In Visual Studio, at least, the library is engineered to play quite well with IntelliSense. And kudos to the Visual Studio developers for making the rollover tooltips also now scalable. This makes making videos much easier. Thank you very much. The circle object has properties you might expect of any library providing the functionality of a circle. We can get its area, its circumference, and its perimeter. But so far, so what? This is all very basic stuff. The library is really about providing functions to analyze how these different shapes interact with each other. So let's try something very basic. If contains, if the circle contains the point, turn true. Contains is a function within this namespace. And hopefully we can see that a circle centered at 2020 with a radius of 15 would contain a point existing at 1010. But let's try anyway. It does. If we place the cursor over the contains function, we can start to see it really is a bunch of modern C++ nonsense. Firstly, it's const expression, which implies that if the compiler can deduce this at compile time, then it should. Secondly, it takes shapes defined as any fundamental numerical type. And in many cases, you can even mix and match types. And thirdly, you may note it says there are 25 overloads for this particular function. 25? Why is that? Well, let's introduce another shape. This time, we'll have a rectangle. Its top left position is at 1010, and its size is 5 wide and 8 high. Instead of checking to see if the circle contains the point, we can simply change this V point to R, and we'll see if the circle contains the rectangle. Again, in this case, it does. But what if our rectangle isn't entirely contained within the circle? Here I've made the width 50. Since the radius of the circle is only 15, there's no way that circle could fully contain that rectangle. And indeed, the output suggests so. But what if our circle overlaps with our rectangle? This time, we know it does. Because the rectangle's top left 
lies within the bounds of the circle, and so there is an overlap. And again, placing our cursor over the overlaps function, we see there are 25 overloads. As it stands at the moment, the library contains understandings of points, circles, rectangles, line segments, where we specify the beginning and end points of a line, and triangles, where we specify the three spatial points of the triangle. Simple functions like overlaps and contains works for all possible combinations. Overlaps and contains are two of the core functions provided by the library. Let's have a look at the header file. Somewhere near the top is something called the function matrix. And we can see the function matrix contains these core functions. The way this matrix works is we find the core function we want and then see how compatible it is with the two arguments. So let's say we wanted to see if a rectangle contains a triangle. Well, we know that our first argument is this rectangle and we can follow along to triangle. There we go. We have a contains function for does the rectangle contain a triangle? This function matrix represents the list of all of the functions the library currently has. And that's the point. It doesn't have everything yet. This is a community project and we're still working on it, but all of these exist already. Contains tests to see whether the first object wholly contains the second object. Closest returns the closest point of the second object to the first object. Overlaps returns true if the first object in any way overlaps with the second object. And now we get on to the exciting functions. Intersects returns a vector of all the points where the boundaries of the two shapes intersect with each other. I've reached the point where running things in the command line is no longer sufficient to demonstrate this library. We need to move to something more visual. And of course, I'm referring to my OLC pixel game engine. If you intend to use the two libraries together, there are some things you should know. The Geometry 2D library effectively redeclares the Vector 2D implementation. So we need to tell the Pixel Game Engine not to use its own, but to use the one built into the Geometry 2D library. This is not a bad shout. Let's have a look. The Vector 2D class provided by the Geometry library is a lot more complete and functional than the one provided by the Pixel Game Engine. Naturally, one is inspired by the other. So if you're used to the Pixel Game Engine's implementation, porting any code over to this should be no trouble at all. All of the names of the functions are the same. Fundamentally, it's been rewritten in a slightly more modern C++ way. It includes additional functions not provided by the Pixel Game Engine. But one of the most popular requests on the GitHub has been to ensure that type precedence follows the same rules as defined by the C++ standard. And now it does. So if you are bizarrely mixing types of numeric vector, ints and floats and doubles will all behave in a prescribed way, the way you would expect them to normally. The Geometry 2D library relies on this new Vector 2D implementation. So if you are mixing the two, please make sure that you're including them into your project appropriately. I've added in the code for a bare bones pixel game engine application. Now I know for some of you, it will have been a while since you've seen any of this. So just a quick refresher. The application class inherits from the Pixel Game Engine and must override two functions. The first is onUserCreate, which is called at the start of the application, and then every frame onUserUpdate is called. Our main simply starts the Pixel Game Engine. In this time, it's going to be a 256 pixel wide by 240 pixel high application where each pixel in game is four by four screen pixels. And right now, all my application does is clear the screen to gray. Let's do a little visualization. I know that for all of this, I'm going to need my mouse's position in the screen. And to start with, I'm going to draw a circle at my mouse's location and have some rectangle fixed in the background on the screen. So let's just draw those. We'll draw a circle at the mouse's location and we will have 15 pixels wide as we did before. And I'm just going to have it be a white circle. I also want to draw a rectangle somewhere on my screen. I'm going to set the top left to be 100 by 100 and we'll set its size to be 120 by 40. Let's just see what that looks like. Oh, first problem. Moving up a C++ standard has made the compiler particularly sensitive about casting. The drawRect function is expecting integer type vectors. 
but we're passing in floating point types. We'll now need to be a little bit more hand-holding with the compiler. Yes, this is quite a regressive step. There's our rectangle, there's our circle. So let's add in some simple tests. Firstly, I'm going to check if the rectangle overlaps with our circle. So I'm going to call the overlaps function, and first I'm going to construct the rectangle with the same dimensions we've used in the drawing code below. Secondly, I'm going to construct our circle at the mouse's location. We'll give it the position, which is just V mouse, and the radius. If the rectangle does overlap with the circle, I'm going to draw it a different colour. So if the result is true, I'm going to draw it red, else we'll keep it as white. Let's take a look. So there's our circle, and as our circle overlaps with the rectangle, the rectangle changes its border colour to red. They've overlapped. If we change our overlaps function to contains, the rectangle should only go red if the circle exists wholly within the rectangle. Now the eagle-eyed of you may be thinking there's discrepancies on this screen. Well, there isn't. Remember that this is a particularly low resolution display because I like the retro look. And as a result, certain pixels occupy a certain amount of screen space. The library strives to be mathematically accurate, not pixel space accurate. Now the reason for visualizing in the first place was to examine the intersects function. I'm going to call the intersects function with the same two constructions. A call to the intersects function returns a standard vector of points of the relevant type where any intersections between the boundaries of those two shapes have occurred. Of course, the vector could be empty if the two shapes don't in any way intersect. But let's draw those intersection points. I'm going to create a little auto for loop to just iterate through all of those intersection points and at those locations, I'm going to fill in a small circle. We'll just have it as radius two and we'll draw them blue. Let's take a look. So as I bring my circle into contact with the rectangle, we can see the intersection points are now drawn also. I might want to try a different shape other than circles. So let's create a mouse shape and reuse it. And it helps not to have your using namespace right in the middle of your code. There we go. Let's change the mouse shape from a circle to a line segment. Naturally, I can't use draw circle to draw a line, so I'll have to change this as well. Take a look. So now you can see I'm drawing a line segment at the mouse cursor. It's intersecting with the boundaries of our rectangle, with one or two intersections as necessary, and the rectangle is still turning red if it wholly contains the line segment. I'm not going to go through all of these potential combinations of functions and shapes, but you may notice there is a sneaky additional primitive in the function matrix called array. And that's not array, it's array. Rays are a strange geometric 2D primitive as they don't tangibly exist, but they're incredibly useful for two-dimensional games and applications. Effectively, array is defined as a line segment with a starting point and a direction. It has an infinite length along that direction. Rays are particularly useful in the what-if scenarios. I'm going to create a ray which starts at the top left of the screen but points along towards my mouse cursor. Direction vectors are often best utilized when they are normalized. So by normalizing the mouse position on the screen, I get a direction vector for my ray. I'm going to draw the ray as a green line. I don't have a draw ray function. So what I'll do is take the ray's origin as the starting point of a line segment, and then to that add in the direction multiplied by some value larger than my screen. It's a bit of a hack. I'll color that green, I think. Let's just make sure this is working. There we go. So from the top left of the screen to my mouse cursor, I've got a green line. This is a ray. Rays too can interact with all of the other shapes. So we can test for intersections between my ray and the rectangle. Let's take a look. So there is my ray and my line segment still being drawn where the mouse is, but as the ray passes through the rectangle, we can see the intersection points. 
I'm going to change the mouse shape back to a circle. Well, I prefer it. Because rays infer that something might happen along a path, we can start to estimate things about collision between the 2D shapes. I'm going to project the mouse shape, which is a circle, along the ray towards the rectangle. Now, the project function returns a standard optional. In much the same way the intersects function returns an empty vector, the standard optional is null if the ray doesn't cause the two shapes to interact. Now, what is a shape projection? Well, let's see what happens. If I take the projection returned object, and if it does have a value, I'm going to draw my circle at that location. It's easier to see it than describe it. There's my ray, and as I project a circle along the ray at the rectangle, we see that there's no interaction until the ray and the circle do interact. Look at that. That's quite nice, huh? So we've projected a circle along the ray at the rectangle, and it's found the point where the circle is just touching the rectangle. Very useful for the start of collision detection. We can also reflect rays off other shapes. Here I'm going to take our ray and reflect it against the rectangle. Again, the reflect function will return a standard optional because there may not indeed be a reflection. So I'm going to check if that optional has a value. And if it does have a value, I'm going to take the same drawing code for the ray I had above, slightly modified to suit the standard optional. And we'll also draw the reflected ray. And I'll draw this in a dark green. Let's take a look. It's getting a bit complicated now, isn't it? There's my ray. And we can see it bounces off the rectangle. And look at that, the angle of uh, incidence and reflection should be accurate. Nice. Now I've barely scratched the surface of what this really great community made library can do. We can do various analyses between different shapes and we can look at how rays and shapes interact with each other. This library is still very much a work in progress. And if you go and get the latest version from the GitHub repo, you'll see there are facilities already to start handling collisions. Unusually for me, the OLC Util Geometry 2D library is a genuinely open source project. There's no way I can do all of the maths for this myself, and I've required much help from uh, different members of the Discord server. The repo is open to pull requests, it's open to additions, it's open to testing. And you can use the function matrix at the top of the file to work out which things haven't been implemented yet. We can see that the closest point function hasn't been implemented for most of these shapes. The idea of this function is to return a point on the line that is closest to the point, or the point on a circle that is closest to a triangle. We've not implemented projection functions for most of the shapes. In fact, right now, all you can do is project a circle onto a handful of the other shapes. And collision detection and handling hasn't been handled at all yet. There's also one fundamental type missing, and we've already started to have some contributions towards that. And you'll notice there will be a development branch of the, this repo too, and that is for polygons. If nothing else, the repo presents a really robust and nicely written Vector 2D class, and provides easily searchable code snippets you can port and steal for your own projects and other languages. It's genuinely open source. Please get involved if you think you can fill in some of these to-dos. The repo also includes a test application. Now, this is important. Don't use this test application as an example of how to use the library. I know that sounds a bit backwards, but the test application uses some pretty advanced C++ to overcome one of the main design decisions of the library. I wanted the functions to be entirely standalone. That is, rectangles, circles, line segments, triangles don't inherit from some base class. This causes problems for the demo application where we want to do lots of checks between all different possible shape types. We can either have a lot of repetitive code or some very, very fancy modern C++ to handle that sort of linkage. The test code can be compiled and run for the browser using Inscripten where you can pick up the shapes and see how they interact with each other as you move them around. 
So here I've got a, a laser beam style ray coming in from the left hand side and we see it interacting with the circle and bouncing around. It bounces a limited number of times uh, around the geometry in the world. We can see how all the shapes interact. So as you pick up a shape it becomes the active shape and the, you can see the uh, intersection points and whether it overlaps and contains other shapes in the scene. If you hold down the right mouse button you can also cast two additional rays into the scene and see how they interact with all of the shapes. And so that's that. That is the OLC Util underscore geometry 2D library. The name is a bit of a work in progress, as is the library itself. If you feel you can contribute, please jump onto the GitHub or the Discord server and take part. There's still a lot of functionality yet to be implemented. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. And I know some of you will be asking, are there any videos this year, Javid? Yes. Until then, take care.